What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Supreme Decisions Legal Minute Podcast, and I'm your host, Supreme Decisions. Today is going to be one of the Red Pill Diaries, kind of episode two. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with it, Supreme Decisions itself is a platform that teaches law on a common level, where it's simplified for the everyday man and woman to actually understand and be able to apply and defend themselves whenever presented with an opportunity of such. Well, the Red Pill Diaries is something that I've gone into that deals with only facts. I'm dealing with only the truth because I'm offering a perspective. I'm not necessarily going into law, but I'm giving you perspective on how the applications go and why the changing of ideas is necessary. Well, in today's episode, I'm going to talk about a video I watched, and it was from the Harvard Law School. As you know, Harvard has the best attorneys in the country, has one of the highest rated law schools in the world. Today's episode deals with the Harvard, a moral side of murder. That sounds kind of like an oxymoron for the most part. But the simple thing is we're looking for morality when we're looking at actual murder. We're looking for a reason to not convict when someone has done something egregious, as in taking one's life. I actually put up a video from the movie Betty where the preacher spoke about crimes with no real punishment. And most of the speech that he gave literally 20 years ago applies today. But here's where I'm going to kind of flip it because I'm offering, again, like I said in the Red Pill Diaries, perspective. Now, for those of you that can see me, most of you guys can see I love being at a park. I'm outside. My eyes are kind of puffy because apparently I'm allergic to pollen now. But what it is that I'm offering is your ability to see clearly, even though mine is impaired at the moment. But let me get into it a little bit because the the idle rambling at this moment, you know, seems a little unnecessary. Simply because today's episode isn't going to be a long one. Generally, the Red Pill Diaries are not long, but it offers you an opportunity to think. Now, when we're talking about a moral side of murder, I'm coming at you through through the perspective of when the good guy is the one that's doing the murdering of the alleged bad guy. The good guy in many of our cases would be the police officer when they're becoming judge, jury, and also executioner. Later, I'll give you more in depth about exactly what it is I'm speaking about. But in this conversation, it's not going to be any particulars, but it's going to offer you again the opportunity to think. Now, the first idea was brought across through... The ideals of a runaway trolley. You are the conductor. You're the one controlling the trolley. Well, in this manner, the trolley has no brakes. It is barreling out of control towards five people. You then see a secondary track. On that secondary track, there's a lone worker working by himself, unknowing unknowingly in the railway directly in front of this runaway trolley. You have a choice. The choice is continue rolling out of control and barrel into the five people or veer off on this lone track towards this lone worker who is unbeknownst, has no idea what's about to happen. Who do you kill? Because that's exactly the question that's being posed to you. But also what is being posed is to why. 
Now, when you make your choice, because again, I want you to think about that and put that in the comment section. Leave that on the ideals. Let's have a conversation about that. Leave all your little snide remarks. I even like those. Send me these out of line emails. We can deal with that. But the question still remains, who do you kill and why? The majority of people said, well, I'll kill the lone worker. Save the majority. Right? Why? Why is that the best option? I used to watch a show called Suits. And Harvey presented Mike with an option. Harvey said, there's a gun to your head. What do you do? Mike said, well, there's only two answers that you can come up with. Harvey said, there's always a hundred. I gave you two. You made a choice between those two, but you forget about there are secondary, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh options. Just because they're unspoken does not mean you need to not go through the context of even understanding what they may be available to you. Because when you make your choice, the majority of people chose, again, to kill the one person. They felt morally, let's say, it, unscathed because they allowed the five to live. Now, the majority opinion on that is better one shall die so the principle five will live. That's the idea. Now, you're not the conductor. The trolley's out of control. You still have the five. You still have the one loan worker. But you're standing on a bridge now. There's a fat guy who's in bad health, leaning over in the same line in the eye of the trolley. Remember in the last instance, it was okay to kill one person. Is it now okay to kill the fat person who's in bad health to save the majority, which would now be six instead of five? Because again, the majority, it was better one shall die so the five shall live. So is it still one shall die so six may live? But here's the next question. Why? I actually thought that was riveting. Because no matter what your moral compass is on this entire situation, these are still aspects that are technically out of your control, but yet there's still choices that you can consciously make. Let the fat guy stay up there who's going to die anyway. Let the trolley kill the five unbeknownst people. Or kill someone that's dying anyway to save all six people. Because again, it was morally right to kill the one man that was working with no clue what was going on. And it wasn't okay to kill the five. The question that was asked was, what happened to the principal? Sometimes the pause isn't even for dramatic effect, but it's an opportunity for you to actually think about what was said because the question was, what happened to the principal? We're often asked about the right thing to do or the moral thing to do. Now, here's the thing. We've never been taught that those are separate issues. The right thing to do and the moral thing to do have nothing to do with one another. Because the right thing to do is what you feel it would be which would allow you to sleep better at night. 
the moral thing to do would be the thing that encompasses you to make the move. Now, there are going to be a lot of people that disagree with that statement. And it's easy. It's cool. It's actually okay. Because I'm actually well enough and secure enough to understand that I'm putting myself out there for that ridicule. I'm putting my statement out there for someone to actually go against it. And it's easy. It's cool. Don't get upset. But it allows a dialogue. Is it something that you can say that can change my moral compass? Because most of our morality comes from experience. Most of our right and wrong comes from experience. Being righted or being wronged. When you talk about the simple simplicities of morality, The oxymoron within that is the actual idea that you can be right. But there's an off chance that you can be wrong. Because the thing is, when you're leaving things in the ideas of right and wrong versus situationally best or better or worse, these are things that are done with expectation management because whether you'll say the five or the one what made it wrong whether you'll push the fat guy or not which makes that right or wrong we are often asked to consider how dangerous being a police officer is I actually, I actually wrote that in because that wasn't part of the discussion. But I gave you guys the idea or context of when myself and my youngest son was in Dallas. We were having a conversation and a police officer said, well, you have to consider how dangerous being a police officer is. And the 10-year-old out of the mouths of babes said, well, isn't being a pilot a dangerous job? Isn't being a window washer a dangerous job? Is And he just rambled off like five just jobs. But the one thing about it is there was a thought process put into becoming a police officer. There was a training process put into becoming a police officer. There was a voluntary conscious act that was put in in becoming a police officer. None of those were I, was my thought or my ideals or my injection thought of. So why do I now have to consider the dangerousness of it? It didn't just become dangerous. It was dangerous when you decided to apply. It was dangerous when you decided to put on the uniform. It's dangerous every day that you step out because I, I, I love Dustin Poirier. Because everybody loves to do karma. Oh, well, the karma's going to get you. Karma's going to get you. But you you also forget that you reap what you sow. And Dustin Poirier, one of the things he put, karma is a mirror. Karma's not a bitch. Karma's a mirror. Because it's a reflection of what you're doing. It's a reflection of your actions. Now, does that mean you're always going to have something good happen if you're doing good? No. Because you're always going to have some sort of challenge. But it's your perspective on how you see the good or bad. Because every bad offers you an opportunity for better. If you don't have that opportunity, are you getting better? But what made it bad is your perception. These are the things that I'm teaching today. Because when you're thinking about do I save this guy or do I save that guy? What makes one's life more valuable than the next? What makes more meaning in one's life versus the next? Because that's what we have going on right now. And we have the, the Karen situation. They're policing by feeling. They're doing things that allows the 
idea of what security is to dictate what goes on with them. Because when you when you have a thought, because I even talked about this, you have an idea of someone being perceived as dangerous. I even spoke about if you weaponize my skin, how can I ever be unarmed? If I don't participate in my own deprivation, why am I the problem? If I'm not doing things that allow me to be free, how is it that I can make your job easier? Because here's the thing. Kwan Green, he was labeled as a hero who prevented the shooting inside the L.A., the La Victoria restaurant in San Jose. The San Jose Police Department opened fire on this young man after he had disarmed a gunman. He did not fit the description that the police was given of the gunman. He did not have a weapon at the time he was murdered. But what happened was the police lied in their reports, which, you know, I often speak about because one, they're using stock language. They can't tell the truth. Two, they can't articulate because they're using stock language and because they're not hiring intelligent people that can't articulate. Jordan V. Prince, for those who don't understand the things that I'm saying. But when they're saying or inferring things, we're expected to then accept their behavior, no matter what it is. We have to make the morality of their actions good. Because the person that they're dealing with had to have been a bad person. The decision they made had to have been the right one. Because if we actually have to look at the situation as itself, we have to go through the totality of circumstances ourselves. If we have to look at it and say this person is wrong for what they did, we're moralizing murder. We're saying that this world is better without Kwan Green, the person who saved several people from a gunman inside a restaurant who was just sitting down eating. We're saying that this police officer's judgment cannot be questioned simply because he's on the spectrum of good or she's on the spectrum of good. But what made them good? What made their actions moral? What made a decision to shoot someone that is unarmed a good decision? Why did we moralize murder? Jamel Robeson. Jamel Robeson was a 26-year-old man, and I'm actually going to talk about him in another podcast because, again, this is something that came up in another situation. But he was a 26-year-old man. He was a security guard. He was in Illinois. Jamel was shot while being a security guard by SWAT team leader. He was told that there was a shooting. Jamir was, Jamel was the hero. The police murdered him while he was working. He did not match the description of the gunman. He was not doing something illegal at the time. He was working. He saved the lives of many others that was just going to his job to entertain themselves. We're then saying that the police officer made a decision that was morally correct when he murdered Jamel for doing his job. We're saying that the world is better without Jamel Robeson because we're moralizing the murder because the person that committed it is supposed to be the good person. That good person also lied. 
You see, you see a pattern that's going on here? So whenever I'm telling you to go, go and get the police report, go and get the warrant application, go get the scene report. These are the same exact people that are by based on Supreme Court, the actual law of the land are able to lie to us every day in every encounter. They're labeled good. But my question is why? What made them good? What action displayed is good? Putting on the uniform didn't make them good. But we're moralizing murder. Now, when we're talking about moral reasoning, most of us are consequentialists. Now, when I actually heard that, it was the first time I had heard it in that term for the most part because it was like the first time I had ever heard the word. Basically, it locates morality and the consequences of an act. That is what we do with police officers. We locate the morality of the actions of the police officers in any action that they commit. Why? Because we are perceiving them as good without any recourse or reason. We are programmed that the police officer is a good person. But we're also learning that most of them have no clue what law is, yet they are law enforcement. So if they don't know what law is, how can they perform law enforcement? That means they're incapable or incompetent in doing the law enforcement job. But we're looking for the morality in their actions when they, we have known them for years to not be trained properly. We look at them escalating situations when they're supposed to be professionals. We had a young man that was by the name of, uh, goodness, Kevin Dingle, Officer Kevin Dingle. And again, I constantly bring Kevin Dingle up because there was a, he went viral on TikTok basing off why. Why? But then he answered his own question by saying, I turn on the TV every day and I see officers doing this. I see officers doing that. But you don't see officers correcting behavior. You don't see crimes with real punishment. You don't see consequences for one's actions. But we want the citizens that they're supposed to be beholden to to be at a higher standard than those that are trustees of the public that are working towards the benefit of the public the ones that volunteer to work towards the benefit of the public we don't want that so when we're questioning their actions we're the bad guy in many of our protests most people have no idea the number of people that actually died in the George Floyd process. Many people don't know the number of people that died in the Maude Arbery protest because the government refers to this as casualties of war. Casualties of war because the exercise in the Constitutional Act is an exercise of war war it's an action of war now when you hear me speak about law you often hear me talk about it in the terms of chess chess is built for strategy strategy is to be implemented on a battlefield that's where the expectation management comes in at because i am implementing a strategy to go into battle because it is looked at as an act of war Because we're looking for moral grounds, moral reasoning for the actions of those that we have deemed to be good. But no, to not be lawful. I'm going to say that. We're looking for the morality 
in the actions of those to be good, but we know aren't lawful. We're looking for an excuse to accept their behavior. We're looking at the deaths for the greater good because that's why when they kill someone like Amir Locke and an officer says, well, he pointed a gun at him, and then we see a video and Amir Locke never lifted the gun off the table. But they also forget to tell you that they weren't even there for Amir Locke. They forget to tell you that Amir Locke was a college student. They forget to tell you he was an honor student. They forget to tell you he was working. They forget to tell you he's taking care of his family. They forget all of that. Because we're looking for a moral context in accepting their behavior. That's what we're doing. We're looking for a more high ground for the actions of those that are deemed to be good, but we know not to be lawful. Because we want you to accept that death of Amir Locke. We want you to believe that Amir's, Amir Locke's life was less valuable than those that took it. Because that's how we're looking at right and wrong and morality, good and bad. We're looking for acceptance. What made it good? What made it bad? What made it moral? Because again, if it's a good action, if it's a good shoot, why lie? If you're that afraid to do your job, why keep putting on a uniform? If that compromises your integrity, What are you doing? Why are we accepting it? The question to you is, is it, or is that the morality that you're looking for? The acceptance of murder. The morality of murder. Because it's a tough conversation to have simply because it makes you think about the conversation you are having. That lets you know there's a problem. Now, the flip side is people moved away from the morality to the act upon the innocent. Juan Green, innocent. Jamel Roberson, innocent. Amir Locke, innocent. Did the morality shift because they were innocent? Or because the person that committed the murder wasn't charged? The person that committed the murder lied. The person that committed the murder and keep in mind these are different people that committed the exact same acts in the exact same orders and it was accepted as moral. Is that moral? Because it now sounds purposeful. I gave you three different situations, three different states, three different cities, three different people, three different actions three different murders three different ex times to accept the morality of murder there was no uproar because the justifying the murder of an unarmed bad person versus remaining silent on the moral act perpetrated by the alleged good guy I'm going to say that one more time because I actually didn't even realize I wrote that down. We're justifying the murder of an unarmed, good, bad person. Because it's okay to kill him in the street if they're bad. Even if they were not bad at that moment. It was okay to murder George Floyd at that time. Even though he was not committing a crime at that time. Because... He used drugs back in the day because he did something back in the day. Today was okay because what he did yesterday, not for what he was being punished for today. 
But when I bring it up, I'm the bad guy. When I call it out, I'm the one that doesn't know what I'm talking about. When I talk about it, we forget that there was a purpose behind it. Because we're looking for the morality in the murder. Because it was perpetrated by an alleged good guy. Categorical. Morality based on duty and rights. It's the system of executions. One of my early podcasts, I did one that talked about state-sanctioned executions. State-sanctioned executions. I went over the entire United States, almost 103 people that was murdered by lethal injection, gas, or electric chair that was knowingly innocent of a crime. Because many of us want to still lash out at the Central Park Five because two of them was actually held in jail after finding out with definitiveness that someone else had committed these acts. Someone else had confessed to these acts. Someone else, DNA, was on this woman's attire. This woman also pointed out someone else and also was older. It was morally okay to question a 14 year old for 17 hours, but it was not morally okay to hold a woman who worked 14 hours accountable for going in the wrong apartment and killing someone because it was perpetrated by an alleged good guy. She then lied about it. It was okay to keep these children in jail and in prison even though they knew they didn't commit this act. It was morally okay. Because it was system sanctioned execution, system sanctioned holdings. Now, many will ask, why will I ever go into this? And Apparently, the man cutting grass don't want me to go into it either. But I also told you today's episode was going to be short and it's coming to a tail end. But the question is, why go into the morality of murder? It's because we're being sculpted, shaped, molded into believing, seeing, and accepting. Believing, seeing, and accepting the actions of the perceived good guy without question and we're deeming that as a moral act because here's what I want to do today my goal is to make clear what is actually at stake in our everyday lives but here's the risk once the familiar becomes strange it can never become familiar again once your mind has been opened, there is no turning back. And for many of you, you can turn off the podcast right now. Close your eyes and when you wake up, the world could be as however you see it or perceive it to be. Or option B. You continue to listen. Your mind continues to expand. I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And remember... All I'm offering you is the truth and nothing more.